of, um, for a little bit of backstory. So um, Anne was in our quiet office. So I'm trying to remember when you left because you started in 2000 that I remember. So were you here for two years maybe? I was there for three years. So I left in 03. And so I so and I was also trying to remember what brought you guys to Boston in the first place. Well, I remember you were teaching out in Newton, right, at the Country Day School. Or? Yes, I was at Newton Country Day School. My husband was teaching up at the Pingree School up in the North Shore, and he's originally from New England. He grew up in Woodstock, Connecticut, just over the border from Sturbridge, Massachusetts. Is and so, um, we should mention. So I think that's a, a big part of kind of what I the topic for today is kind of your musical journey and I think a big factor of that is kind of it's a dual musical journey because Zach and you throughout this whole thing kind of had to figure out how how do we get all these many degrees we need and how do we <laughs> do our research and how do we find teaching positions and how do we do all of this when yes. we both need jobs and education yes and, you know because a lot of musicians have you know, sort of more a more amenable partner so to speak who will be willing to you know just go with the flow and move with you to wherever you're getting your doctorate but that was different from you guys so from here you went to iowa right yes we did we traveled um doctorate. Yeah, I mean, essentially, we were living in, in Boston simply to uh, be able to perform a lot to get some teaching experience. And he had gone to New England Conservatory. So he knew people in the area um, to be able to gig with as a trumpet player. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, we moved out to Iowa City to do uh, both do our doctorates um, at the University of Iowa. And I uh, completed my doctorate in choral conducting and he completed his in uh, trumpet performance and that was in 2006 and that was sort of when the the great discussion what next started and we like you do in academia you essentially apply for almost every job that's available I think we were really lucky at the time because this was right before the recession so the economy was very good there were lots of jobs out there. Um, and at the same time, I applied for a Fulbright grant to travel to Belgium to do some research. And so um, uh, we had all the options in front of us. I, I won the Fulbright and that was a big part of the discussion. Uh, and so we, we literally went to a restaurant, a favorite pizza place in Iowa City with a big map of the United States and pins and said, okay, we have job offers here and here and here. And then there's this Fulbright opportunity out in um, uh, Belgium. And it was, it was kind of a hard decision. I had received a pretty good job offer from Mount Holyoke in Massachusetts. We loved living in that area. Um, but he had this great job opportunity out here in the Northwest at a school called Pacific Lutheran University, which has a wonderful music program. And uh, I couldn't really pass up the Fulbright. So that was the choice we made. We packed the moving truck, drove further west than either of us had ever been, uh, settled well, this in this place. Before you had any kids, correct? With no kids no and kids. no you connections, no family. It was definitely that sort of, you know, well, if we're going to do something this risky and crazy, this is the time to do it. So. Um, I mean, we didn't know a single person out here. And uh, so we, we drove, it took us about four days. Um, and as soon as we settled in, I had about a month. And after that, I hopped on a plane and flew out to Brussels. Um, and that's how I spent the next nine months. And uh, I was able to do some really great research. And that's where I really discovered my love of early music. Um, and uh, after that, it was just sort of jobs fell in our lap, my lap, essentially, I got really lucky. I've been at a church out here, a Presbyterian church for many years as their music director. I taught adjunct for a long time, which is a pretty typical pathway for an academic musician. You know, you sort of do the grunt work as an, as an adjunct professor. And then um, there was a position that opened up at our community college for a tenure track musician and that's where I've been now for seven years. I've been um, chair of music at Tacoma Community College and director of their choral program um, and it, it suits me really well because what 
teaching at a community college allows me to do is to have a lot of freedom to work on my professional um, uh, aspirations. So I've directed, for 10 years, I was director of our local Bach Choir, Seattle Bach Choir, um, and it's a wonderful group. And I conducted St. John Passion and Bach B minor, and we had a cantata series, and it was just um, incredible. Um, and for about eight years, I've been director of the Cine Nomine Renaissance Choir, which is a community choir devoted to polyphony. And I also have my own professional group in Tacoma. It's on again, off again, called the Tacoma Early Music Ensemble. And I do performances and we also do a summer workshop for early music. So I guess you could say my professional life is sort of in two places. I, I teach college kids. I teach a music theory sequence choir and I do my administrative work. And then I've really developed a love for working with adult community volunteer musicians through my different community choir work. That's been a huge part of my development as a musician. And of course, one of the hardest things right now being uh, in this pandemic that those adult community choirs are not really you know, able to even try to come back in person because of the risk factors to many of the singers. And here in Washington, we've had a very conservative approach to reopening. Um, I'm very grateful for that, but it has been challenging for many of my singers who have not been able to sing uh, at all. So, um, so I've developed some online opportunities as we were talking about earlier. But uh, it's, been, it's been an awesome journey. We love it out here. Uh, the people are wonderful. The weather takes a little getting used to, but we love it. Uh, lots of hiking and now we have two kids of course and they're born and raised pacific northwesterners so they see the sun and you know <laughs> <laughs> they don't know right. what to do with it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and i re so last year you guys had a, a sabbatical that you managed to schedule at the same time and i saw you were traveling all over western europe essentially yeah, we again got really lucky with the timing, you know, we we were in Europe for four months and we, um, you know, we sort of hit that academic jackpot where we were able to uh, win sabbaticals at our prospective institutions for the same term. And so we pulled the kids out of school and we um, we started in the UK and spent a month living up in Scotland uh, just uh, east of Edinburgh in a beautiful little village called Aberdour. Uh, from there, we went to Italy for a couple of weeks. Uh, my parents flew out from Cleveland and we were in Florence and Rome and Tuscany. Uh, from there, we went back to Belgium. I've always, uh, I've tried to return to Belgium over the years. I, I love it there. And so we were uh, for a month in Antwerp. And then from there, just sort of slowly crept eastward into Germany and Austria, and then back over to Oxford to try to celebrate some of the Christmas holiday season before coming back. Um, and it was it was an awesome adventure. We, we truly did it uh, not as tourists, but as, you know, citizens and um, took, took our days very slowly and took the time to really explore the neighborhoods and expose the kids to train travel and and walking more than they had ever walked before. Um, and, uh, and to see my kids fall in easily with kids who don't speak English, for example, it was just so exciting to see, oh, that's no big deal. You know, we can still play on the playground together even if we don't speak the same language because we can tell that we just wanna play. So, uh, so that was really wonderful. Did you do homestays or did you bring an RV? <laughs> oh gosh, no, we did, we did uh, like uh, Airbnb, you know, where you can rent a, an apartment for a month at a time, that sort of thing. It was actually remarkably um, uh, uh, inexpensive. We had, we had been, able, we'd been lucky. We budgeted quite um, aggressively for it and we didn't really even need, need to in the end. Um, as much as we did, it was it was uh, it was wonderful to see how your priorities change when you travel. I have to say that um, when I came back here, the biggest culture shock was the cost of groceries. Uh, what we pay here for groceries is is just scads above what you pay for when you're abroad. So I was really shocked by that. Yeah. We are. Any questions at the juncture about all of the adventures for Anne? Hi, Anne. 
Hi, Ray. How are you? It's good to see you. It's been so many years. Oh, it has <laughs> been forever and forever. It's probably everybody's figured out at this point that to talk about music is just an excuse for me to check in with some of my favorite people. Oh, of course. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Ann and I were in the first class. Of exactly. Mm -hmm. The pioneer That's right. to be subjected to all of it. I think I may have asked you this in an email. Do you know my friend Keith Ward? Oh, I do. Yes. Yeah. He was my boss for several years. Oh, really? Okay. Yes, because I taught adjunct at the, in fact, the University of Puget Sound is just a couple of blocks over from where we live. Yeah. Oh, he's a great guy. He, uh, he and I know each other through Star Island, which is the Unitarian Conference Center. Oh, that. I see. He succeeded, yeah. me, he succeeded me as music director. And oh, no kidding. In the 70s. And then we stayed good friends. I sang for their wedding in New Jersey and you know, it was really kind of fun. No kidding. You know, he doesn't live here anymore. Oh, um, yeah, he, no, I, yeah, I, he, I, he uh, they've moved out to Colorado somewhere. I think uh, he took another job and I think the idea was they wanted to retire in Colorado. So it's kind of, you know, he left here and, and went there for his last position and then they'll stay on. So that was maybe now, two years ago now. Learning which is now yeah yeah yeah. yeah 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 i know <laughs> well, has, has your weather stabilized at all around there because we've heard so many things about the forest fire going north and so forth yeah you know we had we had about a, a week where it was pretty miserable um and that's been more frequent over the years but uh but um it's you know as soon as the rains come it just washes all the all the smoke out of the air so we're we're quite lucky now yeah. um and in fact many of my my <laughs> plants are attempting to bloom again uh this <laughs> before the the cold weather sets in uh, actually gardening in the northwest is a real joy so um it's a it's an incredibly long growing season and being home now, teaching from home, I've enjoyed it. Um, How old are the kids? How, How old are they? Yeah, they're 11 and seven. They're doing school from home. Um, we've all been home teaching from home since March. Uh, and so it's a bit of a juggle. We each have our own corner of the house because of course Zach and I teach music. So there's a lot of noise happening in the rooms where we teach. Um, he's learned how to teach trumpet online um, using a, a pretty fancy setup. Um, I've learned how to do choir online, which is uh, very tricky. Um, I can deliver everything that I want to deliver, but I can't really assess. You know, I just have to cross my fingers and hope that my singers are, are learning something on the other end because there is no opportunity, as you know, Heinrich, to make music at the same time. I imagine it might be coming, but. Yeah, I think there are people hard at work on trying to make it happen for all of us. So tell us yeah. a little bit about how you've adjusted to this whole choral music and just your overall, your teaching in this. Sure, music. yeah, well, I can use this. Yeah, this is a good segue because I can use this as a little opportunity to show a couple pictures if I could. Please. Yeah, so I did put together just a couple of things because I wanted to talk really briefly about um, what I normally do and what I do now. So this is something that I normally do. You can see we do every year for many years at a local church, we do a Messiah sing-along. And so this is from two years ago where this is me in the middle and this is my tenor. So we have a professional string quartet and soloists who come in and there's about 200 people who attend. And uh, you can sort of see the way we all know how to be together in a room when we're doing music, sitting close together and all of that. Um, and so this is sort of my normal life. And of course, this is more my life right now, where this is a recent <laughs> church service I sang at an Episcopal church up north in Seattle. And our current regulations in Washington state are that um, you can only have two singers at a time in a church service singing live and there's no in-person worship. So this is all live streamed. So this is my friend, the organist, and I'm one of the singers and my friend Will is the other singer. So you can have a maximum of two singers and we were able to sing without masks, which was pretty, pretty, uh, um, uh, sc scary, I'll say at first, um, but I've done I've done quite a bit of singing with my mask, and that's been uh, 
you know, I've, I've made myself really learn how to do it because I think when we come back as professional, uh, or excuse me, as community musicians, this is how we will come back. Even if there's a vaccine and even if there's a treatment, we'll have at-risk singers who want to participate. And I believe that, that um, people will be wearing masks when they sing. And so I'm trying to learn how to do it and I'm trying to essentially normalize it for my singers. So it's one of the reasons why I can, this is something we were talking about. Um, so this is my group normally, this is an Episcopal church in Seattle where we perform, it's Trinity Parish Church. It's a beautiful old building that was designed to replicate sort of a, a modest English Anglican church. And so normally it's a group of about 35 and we sing polyphony. Uh, and um, this is a smaller group, my summer workshop. Um, but you know, you can even see that, that many of the singers are like traditional community musicians. They tend to be a little bit older. Many of them are retired. Some of them have um, medical, you know, medical conditions that are a real challenge for now. And so this was from last Sunday evening. These are two of my singers and we've been meeting in person and we uh, recorded a performance. And so the idea is to be able to show the singers who I work with that singing with a mask is possible so that when we are able to resume to in-person singing, they'll see that you can still make a beautiful sound with certain accommodations and breathing and maybe the tempo of the music. You know, we're not, we're not gonna be doing Dixit Dominus by Handel with a mask on, but we can do a lot of uh, pieces of polyphony that, that allow for more room to breathe and, and where the diction is not quite as important. So this right here has been doing SATB polyphony. My friend Brian was the only male singer who essentially made the cut of being able to sing in person. I had to ask singers to only volunteer if they were able to meet the CDC guidelines for not being at risk. So under the age of 65, no pre-existing medical conditions. Um, it's the strange world we find ourselves in now, I think. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do is, uh, I, I don't know, I'm, I, I have to become part, part scientist. I need, I need to stay up on the science because I, I'm not, I, I don't really want to wait for the decision makers to tell me when it's time to go back. You know, of course, I'll follow the guidelines, but I do think that our government officials at the local, state, and federal level are not as up on the science around in person music making because, of course, it's not an essential service. So I've been trying to educate myself. <clears throat> and I've been just trying to keep singers engaged because especially with community singers, if you don't provide something for them, they'll simply find something else to do. And then the rebuilding will be that much harder when we come back to in person. Tell me, I was curious about your mask mandate. So is it you said <laughs> statewide for statewide for all churches or is it de denominational? So I think that we have a statewide mandate for um, gathering, and then the um, there is one single mandate that was uh, released back in May about uh, religious services that said um, congregants need to be masked, and um, the, the mandate itself, unfortunately, is, is poorly worded. And I, I mentioned before, I feel very fortunate to live in a state where the approach to um, uh, how to handle the pandemic has been science-based and more conservative. We've, we've, that's been the approach up and down the West Coast. You might know there's a West Coast pack where all three of the states are trying to align the guidance. And... Um, the mandate that was released in May said choir is not allowed for churches. Congregations may sing along in services as long as everybody's masked, um, which is tr it's troubling guidance because to me, a choir of 10 poses less of a risk than a congregation of 50 <laughs> singing. But 
nobody asked musicians when they put that mandate out there. <laughs> so stayed in um, place all these months. What's that? It stayed in place all these months. They yes, huh? um, they're beginning to loosen the man the um, guidance now. Um, like you know, a lot of industries, there's been pressure, um, and it it has become denomination specific. So the Lutheran Church might have a little bit different guidance from the Presbyterian, from the Episcopalian, etc. Um, and it's also countywide. So counties in certain phases are allowed more freedom than others, but. Uh, very recently, the, the revised guidance has been for in-person worship to be allowed to begin in, in certain ways, but the music guidance has not changed. And that is the only guidance that exists, or excuse me, that's the only mandate that exists around music making. So there's no in-person music making beyond what you saw before two singers and an organist happening at any church. Well, it's just fascinating because in Massachusetts, I, you know, Again, who can tell what these, how these things come about, right? Because there doesn't seem to be a lot of clarity in the decision making. But my perception is early on here, there was just so much brouhaha about, I think, a Baptist church out in Worcester that just continued to have services because washed in the, uh, in the blood of Jesus and no harm could ever come to them because they were protected. So there was so much stuff in the media about church services that I think our governor just essentially came to that and said, well, churches, I guess you'll figure out what to do the way you want to do it. And so the upshot of that has been that denominations in general have each kind of come up with what they think is their policy. And I think in terms of the music and the singing, I think people are pretty careful, you know, so the Catholics in theory just have, you know, one cantor and nobody else is supposed to sing, but it, you know, how are you going to stop people if they really want to sing under their mask? And as you say, it seems if you think about aerosols whirling around and all that stuff, that then the more people that are doing the singing, the more dangerous it gets for everybody, because then you can't really control, you know, the singers, I think, typically try to stay 10 or 20 feet away from anybody else. But if the people in the pews that are only six feet, it just it gets to be very confusing very quickly if people make up their own rules, right? So I guess I applaud your, your governor for being able to, to figure out how to issue, issue something that they thought they could stick with. Well, and I think the pressure was there because Washington is the location of that dreaded event that happened back in March with the Skagit Valley Corral. Um, my my colleague is their director, and he you know devastated him. You know they went into rehearsal, and and that was a time when. Um, that could have been any one of us. I had a rehearsal in that same area just a week before, and I remember. Uh, because, you know, Washington, I think, was the place where this really began. And I, I clearly remember I had a concert on March 5th, a choir concert, and it seemed fine to do that. And then I was supposed to have a rehearsal on March 8th. And when March 6th and 7th rolled around and we started hearing the news and there was no guidance on what to do, I, I contacted my friend Karen Thomas, who directs probably the most prominent choir in Seattle called Seattle Pro Musica, to ask her what she was planning to do. Um, and she said, we're absolutely canceling. And I, I thank her every day for leading me to make the same choice. And many of us did. My colleague Adam didn't, and he had that rehearsal only two days later on March 10th. And it's been, um, you know, that we know a lot more about why the outbreak happened the way it did. You know, he was in a small room, no ventilation, uh, no masks. And I, I'm sure even though people were six feet apart, as the guidance was at that time, just the potency of the aerosols combined with the age of the singers created that outbreak. But that's, a, it's been really hard to fight back from that because even now I can go to my you know I've been trying to to actually advocate for better guidance around singing I'm the the state president of our American Choral Directors Association chapter here in Washington we have a lot of k-12 schools that are um, cutting their choir programs because the even though the the, the guidance uh, is is 
good. It's a little outdated at this point and it needs revision. Um, and just that term, no choir is allowed, I think has caused lots of school administrators to cut their choir programs. And, and one of the things that I'm trying to advocate for with my colleagues is that actual choir can continue, but singing in person is the thing that should probably not be happening right now. And that's a real difference in the, in the verbiage. So, um, so uh, what I'm, I'm hoping for is uh, some updated guidance so that we can uh, continue with choir with the blessing of the state and my colleagues can keep their jobs um, and just online is what we're trying to learn how to do. There's been a lot of, of um, uh, workshops around how to lead an effective online rehearsal. So, you know, for me, I've got a fancy microphone that I use. I've got a little light that I use. I have a keyboard over here on my ironing board that I can stand up and use. And I can kind of replicate it uh, a little bit here. Um, and hopefully the singers feel like they're getting a good choral experience, even though it's through their computer. So. Yeah. So how, you know, I'm curious because I always find that so many of these things are, you know, like you were saying initially that they're so unidirectional right now that you can, you know, figure out everything you're going to do and, and direct and, you know, give out, but that it's hard to get anything back. So do you feel completely exhausted after these rehearsals? Oh. If you feel like you're on 100% of the time, even more so than in real life? Absolutely. It's, it's a lot more talking than I would normally do because they're not, you know, when you're leading an in-person rehearsal, you have those opportunities to listen and assess and there's none of that now. And I do feel like I constantly have to provide activities to keep them engaged. And in and, and this way, I'm talking more about my students than about my adult singers. Um, so it's, it is, it's exhausting without but not in a good way. You know, we all sort of know what it's like to participate in a really um, exciting performance, which can also be exhausting, but you have the benefit of feedback. But yeah, this but is just... I find it an interesting thing it is to, you know, and it makes you realize a whole bunch of things about what making music is really about. And a lot of this, you know, intangibles until all of a sudden they're not there anymore. But a lot of the gratification of the experience is the interaction, both with the people you're making music with, but also the fact of being in a room making music for somebody, right? And so yeah. now it's also, you feel you're pushing things into the ether and you don't really know who's <laughs> yeah, absolutely and what is yeah. happening to them. But you know, as I said, like the talk about music, you just have to try whatever you can think of that you can, that you can do in this current situation. We are running out of time, but let's take some questions if anybody has thought of anything they'd like to ask. And we have Bob down in the corner. Yeah, I, I wondered if you've run into the masks that are being developed for singers where they have this great uh, thing sticking out in front. Are you using them? Are you interested in them? I am interested in them. I haven't used one yet. Um, I the, the early scientific guidance was that those masks were not tested for you know whether or not they're more efficient in preventing the spread of aerosol. So that was enough right. for me to not purchase one right away. Yeah. Now there's a little bit more information and there's a, uh, some better designs out there than those initial ones. So I actually have a, uh, a friend here in Tacoma who uh, makes her own and she's making one for me right now so that I can try it out. So I, I would like to see because of course inhaling in a traditional mask is the biggest challenge <laughs> you, because you can't unless see it, that. It's very hard unless it's a perfect fit and the right kind of material, you're just gonna suck the mask right in. So that's why I've been talking a lot about breathing with my in-person singers, you know, taking time for a full uh, but slow breath. So you've been like Goldilocks trying out one mask after another. <laughs> yes, that's right. Ray? And do you have any private students? I don't. It's it's never been something I've been interested in. Um, I have colleagues who teach privately so much more effectively than I do when I've tried in the past. So, but even in terms of just your singers, you know, you mentioned uh, getting them used to singing in masks. It, it kind of amuses me. But when I was studying with Phyllis Curtin at Tanglewood, she always talked about singing into the mask. Oh yes, yes. To use 
And I'm wondering if that kind of imagery would be helpful at all to them because it uh, certainly- you know, I think so. I do actually, with my choral singers, I, I have them at the moment do a lot of keeping their hands on their face because that that whole idea of resonance, I think, is a big part of why we enjoy singing. It's not just the sounds that we make, but the way it makes our body feel. And when you sing with other people, yes. And when you sing with other people, you get the benefit of a whole room of resonation, you know, resonating singers that can really boost your spirits. So when we sing online, I have them do a lot of that. And we do talk about singing into the mask cone. We'll do chest voice exercises where you put your hands down here on your chest. And just so that they can understand that aspect of singing as being a really special one, you know, just especially at a time when we can't really touch other people, you know, just to literally to touch yourself while you're singing has really positive benefits so yeah now there's a literal mask you can sing into i hadn't thought of that yes exactly <laughs> yep all those years of voice teachers have been wow. <laughs> oh some of them just look so funny they look like yeah, duck really bills you know <laughs> the loud room any other questions well, Anne, thank you so much. What a delight to get to, see, to see you and hear you. Thank you. And, uh, Thanks. You know, all you've been doing out there. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I will say really briefly before I go, Heinrich, that I've been taking organ lessons for the past year. So right. yeah, it's been the one thing I've been able to do, make music by myself. And I love it. It's it's keeping my spirits up. I'm not very good at it yet, but I'm playing a lot of Vierne and I saw you have a Vierne performance coming exactly. up. So. Playing the organ is fun, y'all. Everybody try it. <laughs> Thanks so much. And Thank you. Can you, uh, do we have each other's email? I want, I'd like to know, do you know where Keith Ward moved to? What school? I don't know, but I can find out and I'll send uh, an email to Heinrich and he can probably forward it to you if okay. that's okay. Uh, thank you. I, I bet I can find out pretty easily. Because I don't have, we don't have any mutual friends for me to follow up, but I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to. Great to see you. Thank yeah. you. You too. Thanks everybody. Have a good week. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks Heinrich. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>